Welcome to Blind Shovel, an arts and music podcast. Today I had the pleasure of interviewing David Kettner, longtime mentor and teacher of mine who I first met at University of the Arts. He's a fine artist and has been his whole life, still making work to this day. Currently, he primarily works in diptych collages. Enjoy. <laughs> What's up? My uh, my other name is Susan. It looks like I saw that. I was concerned. I don't know how to change that. <laughs> Who's making all that noise? A cat? <laughs> yeah. This is the hour, or even past the hour, when Susan comes home from work, but she's out for dinner tonight. So he's oh, very. No. He's very. Uh, <laughs> he's. He's very magnetized to her. <laughs> Anyhow, that, he'll shut up that? in a little bit, I think. How many basically, cats? he's the noisiest cat we've ever had. You know, we've had a few over the years. How many cats do you have now? <laughs> well, we have two. And this is the Silver, who's howling. Uh, basically, he cries. He just... well, there's another sound. I know what that is. Uh, the land of sound. I have another Zoom meeting uh, in the morning. Really? <laughs> or early morning, yeah. Uh, I do have a show coming up next fall, a kind of a retrospective. Uh, but what we're working on now is the publication of uh, some of my collages. Uh, and for that publication, one of the people who's going to be writing about them is John Stesiker, who is a British collage artist who's <clears throat> extremely well known all around the world. And yeah, 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 I remember you telling me about this. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like he's uh, been supporting me. So, anyhow, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, because London time is four hours. Earlier or right. five depends on whether we're on daylight saving time. That's mm-hmm. such a cute cat. <clears throat> so I'll be talking with him and the and the uh, the whatever the host of uh, the sponsor of this publication. So we're in the midst of seeking funding now, which is really not my responsibility, but I have to participate in the information that's provided. Right. So what does it look like on the daily in terms of the art practice at this point? What does it look like in terms of my daily art practice? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a good opening question. <laughs> um, because I, I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm retired. So we start with that reality. Yeah. I'm home all the time. Mm-hmm. But I can't be in the studio all the time just because you run out of things to do. And what's most interesting to me is how much I can accomplish if you give me about five minutes. Mm. Years ago, uh, back in the 70s, uh, I heard on the radio at the time an interview with Warren Beatty. Oh, you know, back then he was a a big, sexy kind of star. Bonnie and Clyde and and, uh, what was it? Shampoo, maybe. Uh, Anyhow. Do you know Warren Beatty at all? Or is that <laughs> okay? Well, he, he was known for uh, dating just about every mm-hmm. starlet there was, and, and they were known for dating him. But anyhow, he was a very creative guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was he, he made movies. Uh, he starred in movies. Uh, and he's still around. Um, anyhow, he said that he's good for about three minutes in the morning for uh, creative work. And then he spends the rest of the time partying. That's not a little bit like Mozart, actually. Yeah, yeah. If you believe what... So that's what you've been doing. Uh, No, I I don't know how to party. (laughs) 
I just, uh, you know, in fact, I don't like parties. Uh, so it suits me well that I'm retired and I, and I live in the house. <laughs> uh, yes. So, so back to the, back to the interest in uh, what my studio uh, act, activity is like on a routine basis. Um, a col- uh, now, and this was never the case in the past, possibly because I wasn't retired, possibly because the collages have evolved uh, in terms of how many pieces have to come together before the image is done. So <clears throat> now it's basically two pieces have to come together. And, right. and that way for a kind of a long time, actually, if you think about time beyond one year. So it's been several years. In fact, when I look back, to whatever, 2013, so that would be almost 10 years. Most of them were produced by two or three pieces. Be- before that, and when I say before that, we go back to about 1988, and that's when Emily was born, uh, and when collage started for me. And in those collages, there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fragments Right. I recall you used to collage your children's work. Yeah. Right? Is yeah. that how it started? Um, <clears throat> I got to think back on what the real start of it was. Yeah. Well, I've always known I, you as a fan of the diptych. Yeah. Well, I'm still, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, that would still uh, apply because. Most of these collages are in yeah. two parts. Right. Uh, and, and so, but, you know, that's probably around the same time, 1988. Uh, I started putting canvases together. Uh, and that, that also was an accident. I mean, when I say also, it seems like a lot of what has happened in terms of progression or <laughs> movement towards the next thing. Uh, began as some accidental thing in the studio. So when you have a canvas leaning against the wall, you know, uh, which is probably true about any painter's studio that you can think of, uh, then you see two of them overlapping each other and something clicks. I think that's sort of like how it started. So, right, I put, then, yeah, so, I, yeah. so I put a couple canvases together, you know, and they weren't necessarily the same size. Mm-hmm. Um, and then <clears throat> because in 1988, when, when Emily was born, also was uh, basically congruent, concurrent. What's the word? Concurrent uh, with uh, dropping out of painting and moving into collage. And I don't know all the reasons for that, but um, I did have a lot of scraps uh, left behind from preparatory work on the paintings. They were the type of process where you figure a lot of stuff out ahead of time. Right. Um, and uh, so I had a lot of templates around and I had, uh, and, th- and then I had some scribbles around. Then I had some like a, uh, well, I didn't have too much, you know, like Emily wasn't old enough yet to do her own drawings, but there was debris around in the studio and I started working with that. Never using, or almost never, I should say, to be on the site side, um, f- uh, photographic material, magazine material. Right. It was all pieces of paint uh, or, or portions of drawings. Um, and so I did some paperwork like that, and the, and then I didn't end up. I ended up trashing most of those, but but then I tried to scale some of those little paperworks up into canvas, and that became a, <clears throat> like a copycat kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to copy this, but it's going to be in you know lofty paint and, and scaled up. And, so, so I would make these uh, shaped canvases, uh, which took about as much time as it uh, took to paint them because they were angular and uh, irregular in their 
the contours, a straight contours. Mm-hmm. When you look back on, and I like the website you've been maintaining, it looks very good. But when you look back on all the work you've made, you know, because you have the archives here. Yeah. Do you see a relationship between these paintings in the 70s and what you do now? Um, that's also a, a good question. It's one we're facing right now in terms of how the exhibition will be put together. Right. Uh, and also what is the background material for the, for the publication that focuses on the collages? Uh, and it's still up in the air for me to know. Um, but there's, there's no doubt in the mind of the director of this show is Richard Torchia from Arcadia. He's a very smart guy. He's been there for a long time and he's uh, he produced a lot of important shows. So I'm happy to be dealing with him because he has um, discovering uh, just in all of our inter- interactions that he has a, an exceedingly good, uh, we say good eye, but a, a good uh, uh, interpretive uh, skills. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but he, but he's also saying, you know, it's not obvious. So let the viewer be stupefied for at least a little bit, you know, by seeing in the same show things that don't have uh, methodologies that are the same. They don't have, you know, forums that are, formats that are the same. Um, uh, but at least one thing the uh, all all the geometric paintings had uh, that were mostly based on the composition by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach um, was a, a diptych format, right? A diptych format, uh, and prior to that, they say when you go all the way back, I can go all the way back really with archived photographs. Of the, uh, to 1968, which is when I graduated from got my masters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point, I was doing very small paintings, figurative paintings, usually between two people. Mm. You know, sort of like uh, uh, romance stuff. Um, you know, male female uh, relationships, uh, and. Even though when those were, when I finished doing those, which was probably by 1971, uh, then there was a great gap before I went back to a figurative imagery. Yeah. Um, like 1986. What is that? 60, 71, I think about 20 years. Right. So, um, not to lose, uh, not to lose the uh, thrust of your question is how do they relate or how do I see them going from well, there? Yeah. To give you my perspective on it, I've only been making art in some aspects, you know, let's say like a decade. Right. And mm-hmm. it's such a small time span in actuality. I don't know what I'll make when I'm your age, but I have found that when I try to intentionally run away from myself via some new process or medium, I, I'm unavoidably returning to myself. So I'm certain that all of this work is you and it is yours in some sense. Yeah, I never had any question about that. You know, I had a, an experience once uh, in the early 70s when I took a portfolio to New York uh, to the uh, Whitney, I believe. Uh, and, you know, this was a different period of time. There was no networking. There was no, you know, online way to present yourself to anybody. Uh, right. So I guess you would write a letter or something. And I, I was, a, you know, I was a kind of a confident about myself in a way that maybe I didn't have a reason to be. Yeah, that's good. Uh, but that, that, you know, that was my nature at the time. I think I've softened a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that was, I was 30. 35 years old, something like that. So it's a good age to be confident. <laughs> yes. You, you get things done when you're confident. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and anyhow, I took this portfolio and had three kinds of work in it. But in my mind, it was all my work. You know, I, I felt. So I showed it to Marsha Tucker, 
uh, rest in peace because she wouldn't be alive today. She was uh, director of drawings or something at, at Whitney. And she opened up the portfolio and she looked through it and she said, these are all different. <laughs> and I said, no, they're not. <laughs> I forget how the conversation like, uh, you know, evolved after that point, but she did say, I'll give you a show of this, of these portraits. Right. It was a big deal, you know, uh, to, to say she's going to give me a show. I mean, it was a, it was just six drawings. Those were my six self portraits. Um, so uh, were you OK talking. with showing those outside of the rest of the work? That you oh, did? yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't think. Yeah. I, you know, you know, I understood. Yeah. I, and also they were the best. Well, let's see. What did I show her? I showed, I showed her the uh, early halo drawings, too. If I don't know if you know those, but they're on the website. Uh, uh, very systematic drawings uh, in yeah, take, yeah, yeah. taking place inside circles. Mm -hmm. And then I showed her these uh, oil pastel quick sketches of Western landscapes. Um, so, you know, she went for the self-portrait, which made sense to me in terms of what, you know, would make a, a solid enough show if there's only six works in it. Right. Yeah, so I, I went back to that point because because of this notion of uh, um, your, your notion of uh, uh, the, d the different ways in which the work can look over a period of time. Right. Or the idea that you can make something that isn't you. Oh, it, that's, that's what it was. You know, it's a strange. That, that, that's yeah. what the point was. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, I think it's a beautiful idea, but it's almost like inescapable. You can't, get away from it it can look different visually but you know it's interesting to me that you would be referencing johann sebastian bach and then also using your children's drawings when they're very young as a kind of structure so there's kind of a pattern fascination no uh, a, a pattern a structure yeah. and i know i've said this before about bach bach was is one of these you know unique musicians that can you can play Bach on any instrument because it's about the structure. It's mm. not about this, what they call what the sonorities or whatever. The, the uh, I, and you can't do that with every composer. Right. I, I think when you do it with the wrong composer, it just sounds weird. You played music, right? And not anymore. But you did. I remember you were. I not. did. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that was part of what came out of the halo drawings, I think. Mm hmm which were very systematic and they were, you know, dealt with number. And I thought, okay, uh, uh, I had, again, some of this is on the, is, is on the interview I did like whatever, eight years ago or mm -hmm. 10 years ago, but I had a, uh, a three speed tape, uh, open reel tape, uh, deck, a uh, tape recorder, Tanberg. Uh, and the number three was big when I was doing these halos. It probably went back to the notion of the Trinity or something, but, yeah. uh, uh, but, you know, so, and I had some rudimentary skills in percussion instruments. So I, you know, I started to record various patterns uh, and, uh, and then I did actually a couple of pretty large drawings that, uh, transcribed the music and that, that would led me to the notion of, well, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not a musician, really. I don't know how to compose anything. Uh, uh, so I'll take, uh, I'll take some composer that, you know, I enjoy for his structure and translate those. That, that's what became, ultimately became those big geometric paintings. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the, the way your motives change over a lifetime, you know, it's kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Again, and by the way, I have no mm -hmm. doubt that you'll be, uh, you'll be doing art for the rest of your life. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Know, absolutely. Just, I, I'm sure you don't have any questions about that, but sometimes a no, person yeah. does. And there's so many people that have it, you know, I mean, the percentage of students I've had mm. right over the 40 years or just one year, if you want, yeah. Very low. 
Right, right. And, and, you know, that's not threatening or anything. You know, I mean, we got plenty of artists in the world. Then we got too many. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. Well, we have too many that promote <laughs> themselves as such. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. That's what I'm getting at. Is like maybe in college, the person's motive is well, they got maybe they have a low GPA in high school, and they just want to be cool, and they want to fuck, and they want to drink, and they want to be able to pass a class without even really doing anything. Which is my experience of U Arts, but uh, I do so. Not my personal. You know lot, no, no, but you know a lot of people that you had <laughs> that, that opinion about. Yeah, you know. but you know, you're you said you're excited for this show. This I'm not I'm not trying to be morbid, but like there might be a true liberation that occurs later in life where it's not about that. You know, it's genuinely about the work. It's not about the careerism where it'll get you in twenty years. It's about right now. And how do you think about that? You know? Yeah. Well, you know, I I have a very a uh, slim resume in that way, you know. In what sense? Uh, well, well, you know, how many shows have I had? And how many of them have been in galleries? Right. You know, you can right. count them. Of course, you can count big numbers on one hand if you keep yeah. <laughs> repeating the fingers. But <laughs> the, the notion of, uh, you know, counting on one hand usually means, yeah, can you get up to five? Because that's how many fingers you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it's a very slim resume in that way. In, in a lot of ways, actually. Right. Uh, especially since we're looking at 50 years. Mm-hmm. So I can be excited about this show now, can't I? No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. It's like, but, but the excitement would be different. It would be pure, I would assume, because it's not actually about... Like what I'm saying in, in the 20s, 30s, maybe you're angling to have shows or residencies to build a resume to get this job to do all yeah, this yeah. but that can't surely can't be the motive at this point in a career you know no what when you say at this point you mean at my age yeah yeah no it can't be um but that's probably a good thing no uh yeah i mean uh, i think about like do i even have what it takes to be well known mm, to be well known you know, how do people be well known? They're out there. They're, yeah, they're having sure interviews. Sure. They're getting yeah. they're getting lots of public uh, uh, exposure. Uh, and uh, and who are these people? Well, a lot of them deserve it, mm. but uh, and the ones that do deserve it because, for one, they handle themselves well in in um, interviews. <laughs> Uh, they handle themselves well in in the social, you know, the social uh, web yeah. uh, of art and artists. Uh, they travel easily, <laughs> you know. Right, right, right. Um, right. So there's a few things on that list that that don't really relate to me. I don't travel at all, and never, never have, other than you know when I was younger. But it was really? never traveling to galleries and, right, right. and, and uh, looking for shows. Well, similar, you know, Emily spoke about, some, you know, similar, like she wants, she's just inside. She wants to be inside, but she's also limited in some ways. Yeah, but, yeah. but do you want to be well known? Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't think I'm cut out for it. <laughs> I, you yeah, know, like if I would, if I, I would, I, you know, I would like the work to be out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Although it doesn't seem to affect my production that it's not. Right. I mean, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't go to my studio every day, if only for a few minutes. Yeah, Uh, I I pity those who don't have that outlet because, I don't know. You know, sometimes it can feel like a burden to have the impulse to have to make things in this kind uh, of way. But I think... Especially in older age, I'm sure it's a comforting practice that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. Something to soothe. Uh, you know, it's, it, it seems like a lot of people don't have it. No, no. It, it, you know, it seems like, uh, especially, in, you know, uh, what do people do when they don't have a job anymore? They're retired. Uh, uh, how many... What's the percentage? I don't know if there's statistics out there that that people just stop kind of, yeah, you know, they don't know what to do anymore. So they go to casinos. (laughs) 
Have you ever had a major block, like a long, I'm talking like a writer's block of six months, a year, something like this? No. You don't seem to struggle with that. You're prolific. Uh, I wouldn't call, you, you know, I, I would, a prolific is, is, uh, is, is sometimes there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And other times it's slower, but I think that mostly has to do with, I mean, would you say you're prolific when you're spending three months on the same painting? Depends how many other paintings you're working on at the same time. No, if you're working on one painting. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, that's not prolific, although yeah. it's working every day and True. maybe for eight or nine hours a day. I mean, I know people like right. that. Right. I, I know artists like that. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting about your work over time, it also seems like there's two modes of making where, yeah. for instance, the stick is very meticulous, very zoomed in yeah, on this one thing. Yeah, it's maybe 50, 60 hours, yeah. And then you have the collages, which, like you said, could happen in three to five minutes. Right. Or and less. Right, it could happen. You know, in, currently, uh, not, hmm. not three or four years ago, but... Uh, 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 yeah, my early work was very uh, 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 intense in a manual way. You yeah, know, yeah. Time yeah. it took to get a result um, because of how many brush marks you had to make. <laughs> oh. I always, like, I, for me in my early 20s, I thought I had, and I did, I thought I had to prove something. And, and all, thus my comics are much more rigorous in terms of even just the amount of lines or stippling oh yeah they're i had to prove prove my worth and sacrifice my time to the viewer more and more i feel less uh indebted in that way i don't know if what's good or bad uh in terms of what makes a better work of art but i do think you know it's hard you don't to imagine. know that in your own work or you don't know that when you're looking around <laughs> What's good or bad? Um, you probably do. It's pretty. It's pretty interesting. I think, like, I am trying to put myself in your shoes and something. I imagine that if I can look back on sixty years of work, there's going to be a kind of roller coaster ride of what's good and what's bad. There's going to be phases okay. that aren't great. Uh, it's not going to be this exponential growth of good work. It's going yeah. to be phases where there's lot. peaks. Yeah, uh, cresting and yeah, cresting. And cresting. Uh, and, but, uh, but you asked about uh, uh, was there ever a, a period of block? Uh, is that yes. something that you have occasionally or never had? Because no, it seems like me, you're always working. No, yeah, because I think there's just many. I have many outlets. So no, yeah. I've been. I have too many ideas. I'm not cursed with the. Yeah. Lack of ideas. Some people, and that, that can be a problem having too many ideas, but no, in, in the most negative sense, I'm haunted by the impulse to make. I don't think it has to be negative. I think, uh, if you're, you know, if you're given a certain skill set and power, you have to use it. I don't really like people who are very talented and, and lazy about that. That mm. feels very, you know, people like that. Yeah, yeah. People like that in, in in an art world kind of setting. Well, but well, the beauty of this age, I'm 33 now, but it's just like if you had that mentality, maybe you got away with it in college, but you're done. You know, like mm-hmm. if this, you're finished. You, there really is a great filter of time, and obviously, you've lasted that the test of that time i'm sure you know very few artists so your age who continued making work till the end you know um, just just well-known ones but in terms of colleagues yeah, yeah. Uh, um I, I don't i don't have too many of those colleagues even around anymore but of the ones i can think of uh, at least the, you know the one i'm closest to he's still working and, yeah uh, uh, who's that is that jerry yeah he's still ripping huh well it's a little hard it's a little hard to know for sure because he's been through the ringer with uh, yeah. triple heart surgery a couple of years ago yeah. but uh, and but we don't uh we call each other 
or rather he calls me. I don't call anybody. <laughs> I don't. It's just I, like Emily. I would think I'm interfering with what yeah, you know, yeah. I hate to find them in a bad moment. I will email people right, right. very regularly, but uh, I, yeah, I have to just say, you know, people mm-hmm. have to know me that if they don't hear me from me uh, on a telephone, it's just yeah. neither does anybody else. So it's not personal. Yeah. Well, and to wrap up that one thought, it, it uh, seems improbable that you would have been comfortable making these, in some ways, very confident two-piece collages early in your career. Yeah. Because I think early in one's career, and I do think it's the right mentality, you are seeking to prove something to yourself and, and the world that you are an artist. And yeah, these- and complexity for me was part of that. How, how complex can I make this? Right. And, and, you know, and, and how much skill can I show? You know, and what does skill mean? You know, it usually means your hand is doing a lot of stuff mm-hmm. well. You know, doing a lot of stuff well. And I guess I've talked about this a little bit in the past that uh, there, there's not a lot of hand skill that shows in what I'm doing now. In fact, no. you know, the only thing I'm using my hands for is uh, cutting an edge, <laughs> uh, you know, mm-hmm. or gluing something down. But I couldn't hand any of that over to anybody else. It, it's all it's that precise. And, you know, in some of the, uh, I've said this before, too, it's a problem when you have an interview, you know. Uh, I had one interview, uh-huh. whatever, in the 2013, uh-huh. and I keep thinking, you know, I'm repeating some of the things I said in that interview. I wouldn't worry about that. No, well, now I've had, now I'm having another interview, and I guess I had one in, in the middle. But, um, yeah, some, some of the uh, Things I do with the scissor involved hairline cuts. You know, right. it's not going to show up. No, and no, no. It's not what people consider. Hey, you know, you know, got skill. Um, you know, something I've been asking a lot of artists about people who just had children. And as I think about having children, it's an interesting question for me how that affects <laughs> someone's art practice. Obviously, you integrated it pretty well, you know, by working with your children's collages and drawings, et cetera. But do you think anything changed dramatically when you had children in terms of, you know, just the amount of time you could allot to the work or how you decided to work? Uh, no. I like that. It's, it's the, uh, you know, <laughs> summary knee jerk reaction. Good. Uh, the first thing I did uh, when Emily was born, I was already into some preparation for a class uh, at UR's drawing class that had to do with abstraction and uh, uh, one of the aspects I wanted to cover as abstract drawing was uh, uh, geometry and its role in setting up imagery and so forth. And uh, so I was doing some studies uh, of paintings relative to their architecture, you know, their underlying uh, 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 armatures and so forth. And uh, so I got this, uh, and you've, you've probably heard this before too, but it was an important, uh, important kind of um, threshold uh, that uh, coincided with birth of uh, my first child. So there, there was the, uh, there was the certificate or the document of her birth with her footprints. Yes. Uh, and you know, I wanted to do, I wanted to see whether there was some kind of geometric or architecture to that. So, uh, so maybe that was some sort of like unknown, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, bridge to just going forward. And it wasn't long before, you know, Emily was toddling around and, and uh, you know, wanting to, do, wanting to do her own drawings or put stickers on the ones that I was doing. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't know. And you think back on it, uh, it, it, didn't, it, it didn't have any impact on the time or the focus and and I don't know. I mean, I, I have this uh, a friend 
out in California now, who Emily knows too, uh, uh, Daniel Gerwin, uh, who, while you were a student, I think he taught a couple courses in, in our program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, he's an artist and he moved out to, he was married, moved out to uh, California and had, had two boys within a short period of time. Uh, and he's now spending a lot of time writing and, and also uh, writing about uh, and exploring sort of statistics and interviews with artists who have children. Really? Yeah. Oh, I got to talk to him. Yeah, I find yeah. that. Okay, I mean, and, and uh, it's Daniel Gerwin is his name. Mm -hmm. uh, G E R W I N. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he writes about shows. Mm -hmm. uh, he knows a lot of artists. Uh, he's done some research, uh, you know, uh, uh, research. Oh, I, rem artists. I remember him. He did like the Giotto inspired boats, I think. Yeah. He's, yes. he's doing he's something quite different now, but it's all yeah. been influenced by his children. He's a good dude. I like that guy. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to him. So he may have even set up some shows. Now, I think he has an article or something. I didn't read it, but um, uh, but uh, you know, and he no, he 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 bought uh, one of the when he was in Philadelphia and was still teaching together. He uh, he bought one of my collages that was based on all the children's scraps. Um, mm -hmm. So he had some kind of interest in that even before maybe it hit him. Hit him, you know. In his right, right, life. right. Yeah. yeah, there is an interesting. I mean, you use a lot of uh, source material from kids' books, coloring books. You said that you exclusively avoid photographs, right? Right. Do you do you know why that is? Well, for one thing, I, you know, a lot of collage production is based on, uh, on you know. Uh, magazines and of course uh, national uh, geographic yeah, it's uh, very mundane uh, and, and i don't you know uh, i mean uh my cyber friend mm -hmm. uh, john stesicker is known for his collages of photographs uh and and so you know i'm not i'm not poised against it or anything but i, I was always interested in this sort of uh uh, you know, flesh and bones of uh, art marks. You know, right? What what these art marks look like, and uh, uh, so uh, these collages always came out of. Uh, I mean, maybe the early ones had some kind of uh, regular studio debris that could be clippings or xeroxes or something. But uh, uh, and you know, I wouldn't be against. I wouldn't be against moving outside of the sphere, but uh, I, I do want to be careful about what the materiality of the image is. And uh, I just. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. I, I prefer it. Um, in respect to the content, yeah. I, like, I like the strangely perverse ones. The one I own is fairly perverse. Yeah, right. Do you think, in any sense, that these works tell you something? about yourself while you're making them? No. Uh, well, not in that sense. In fact, um, I don't show a lot of the, uh, the the ones that have an edge to them like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm not doing as many uh, as I was for a couple of years running. Yeah. Um, and, and I mostly thought they were funny. You know, I they mean, are. They are funny. Or, or they were a combination of creepy and cute. Which, you know, yes, like you yes. couldn't have one emotional feeling about them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking and, at some of them. And, and it's funny because, you know, it's a pretty sensitive culture we live in now. You know, exactly. it's very easy to offend somebody. Yeah. And it's also very tempting for a viewer to uh, treat artwork psychologically. Like, right. who is this behind the scene? Yeah, which is a and, mistake, I think. Uh, it is a mistake. Although, yeah. you know, I have to recall that when I was uh, in graduate school, I was probably trying to hide it a bit, but I was doing autobiographical narratives. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and then that became of very little interest to me. And it's like, I, I don't want to hear my own voice. It's sort of like, it was sort of like, yeah, I, I don't trust my own voice or, or my own ability to think up stuff uh, yeah, yeah. based on my experience. 
I recall watching this interview and he's a funny example of Balsas and they're kind of talking to him about, they're trying to reduce him down psychologically, basically calling him a pervert. You know, his paintings are pretty, oh, yeah. his paintings yeah, are pretty yeah. one-to-one and he's all, but he himself, and maybe he's being convenient is just kind of like, I don't really go in for this whole psychological reduction mm-hmm. of the work. On top of that, now we have political reduction of the work. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, I believe it stems from a kind of an empowered group of idiots who went to liberal arts school and art school who sincerely don't know how to grasp the way one looks at art and they want to reduce it to metrics that are almost measurable and very literal ways. You yeah, know? I think that's how we understand, how we think we understand a lot of things. Is we have to somehow reduce it first to, to, to right. some uh, simple uh, concepts. It's interesting that um, uh, that neither in this book nor in the little show I had in London mm. that the uh, that the curatorial approach was uh, these could upset people. In other they, words, they were. They were. I not. won't pick this one because it's a little too sensitive. Mm. To, you know, to the to the cult, to the not client necessarily, but but yeah. to the cult. I don't want to have to deal with that as the uh, sponsor of this show or of this book. Uh, and so that didn't have too much an effect on me. On me, I think of moving away from them. Mm. But you know. Uh, I would send, let's say, some of these pieces to, you know, a friend, an artist friend I grew up with, went to school with and so forth, who basically was was known for rather edgy mm. uh, paintings. And I would say, you know, uh, I could send these to him because he could joke around and say, you know, the police are going to be at your house. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> asking questions. Uh, you know, he, he knew what the uh, what the sort of knee-jerk reaction to these things could be. And so I avoided most of, you know, I would send them to you too, because they know how, you yeah. know how to look at them. Uh, uh, um, but um, it, it's it's a little strange. I mean... What have you seen? You had a, you have a long perspective on this, but in terms of, you know, what I find so insidious currently is that the sensorial impulse is now in inside of the art community whereas in the past it resided in the church or the conservative uh, yeah. and that was a healthy balance harmonious okay do you have any in your life have you seen this occur before where the this sensorial impulse has made made itself manifest within uh artists themselves almost i i don't know i don't think i uh spent too much time thinking about it mm-hmm. uh but, but uh, you know, I, I always like to use the word paradox in some of these images. You know, it's two things, you know, exactly. and they're, they're kind of, you know, contrary to each other. So you could say, hey, you know, that's taboo stuff. But it's also what innocence can do. Right. You know, like when you use children doing the things that if an adult did it would be, would be considered, you know, perverse. Yeah, uh, it's not considered perverse when a child does it because you know they're in, you know they don't have it's true. whatever it, it's they don't carry the same sort of uh, uh, corruption you might say yeah it's I also mean, your work original is, sin right like yeah. uh, they <laughs> might they might carry that were you raised a uh, Christian yeah oh yeah my father was a minister beautiful uh, what, is, what is your relationship my was to the you? church organist. Wow. Uh, you know, I sang in the choirs. Beautiful. You know, I went to catechism classes. Uh, what is your what is your relationship? World. Yeah. Back, you know, I, you know, basically late 40s and early and 50s. What you know, is your in relationship? In the community, there were no black people. There was one Jewish family. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was there was no drugs. Mm hmm. 
And there was no political uh, arena. There was uh, there was no global consciousness. There was no network. You know, there's no internet. <laughs> that right. Very simple world. So uh, it was easier, I guess, uh, in that way. What What is your relationship to Christianity at this point? What was that like? Yeah. Uh, it's a complicated symbol I, structure. Yeah, I don't have any relationship with organized religion. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I do have, well, I can't shake the, you know, the things I I grew to believe in, not because of church, but because of further beyond beyond the sort of teenage family, family world was more reading and the reading was more widespread, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, cl- you know, class uh, religions around the world. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, and I was probably in my twenties uh, to to evolve away from the sort of rituals and the notion that the church was a community. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't a community for me after I left my family. It wasn't people I knew or even wanted to know. Uh, so it didn't function as a kind of community bond. So right. I left, I left and, uh, but I didn't leave. I, I mean, I didn't leave, uh, a lot of the beliefs behind. And in fact, you know, I was going to say like, you, you know, the, these children drawings, I keep thinking in terms of the garden of Eden and original sin and, and, the uh, you know, read a lot of William Blake and he wrote these songs of innocence and experience and the marriage of heaven and hell and yeah. uh, these kind of paradoxical combinations of um, uh, this versus that. And I, even though I wouldn't say I understood him <laughs> like scholars understand him, right. but uh, it, it did have a kind of root uh, it did lay down some roots that have been there from from and are still there. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We were talking about how to view art. I didn't understand the beauty of that paradoxical nature of Christianity until I made enough art to slightly begin to understand oh, that way of thinking. For sure. Yeah, and I believe Adam and Eve, that story of Adam and Eve is one of the most beautiful stories you know it seems so common to me i went to catholic school Mm -hmm. 10 years and it's interesting in this in the same way i don't think i knew how to look at art then i didn't know how to look at any of this this story or the bible in general yeah uh and then through making art yeah art really i i don't know how you could be atheistic in the in the strict sense while making because it's so surreal. The process is very surreal. The the place where the ideas come from, the impulses come from. But yeah, it's funny when people attack Christianity, like it's, it's part of the scientific uh, framework as if it needs to make rational sense. And uh, it is incredibly paradoxical, including the idea that you would have three gods within one Uh yeah, I see it as more and more beautiful every day. That doesn't mean I'm interested in evangelizing or even yeah. understanding some of it. Like, I don't even claim to understand it in any strict sense. It's more like I look at it the way I would look at art now. So it's, it's through art, though, that uh, yeah. you yeah. open, open, you, you, you found more openings uh, in. Uh, so the, the reason I think, I don't know if this makes sense, but. I believe that the only way to understand God is through the process of creation. As he created you, you would need to perform an act similar to what he did. And to think about God is going to get you nowhere. Uh, so for me, like, yeah, the process of creation, the generative impulse. Yeah, maybe that's it, you know. Started making me think. Uh, it felt more and more like I was made. And there's a really beautiful thing when you can leave behind those foundation. You never leave behind the foundation, your principles, but you can start going beyond them and, and becoming your own 
being. But yeah, I, I do believe part of the real problem with a consumerist society is it's inevitably atheistic, even if it claims not to be, because yeah, I, I think only through work and creation can you know God, you know? Not only consumer society, it's like entertainment society, which I don't know if it's quite the same thing, but uh, a, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, the, a lot of the creative work we see around here still has the problem of having entertainment as its as its uh, reason for being. It's true. It's either propaganda or it's pornography in some sense, mm. and. That is a problem. I don't know what, like you, you taught for many decades and I don't know what art school is doing to curb that, but it, it I can't is. see that it's doing anything. No, I don't. I mean, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I got out just in time. <laughs> how, long did you, how, long did say, you, hmm? how long did you teach in the end? Uh, uh, 42 years. 42 years. So, you, you know, the beauty 68 of. 68 to, to 68 to 2011, 2012. 2011 you were the last class yeah i mean i'm sure we could talk for hours just the the because i mean i do believe in wisdom and and uh maybe because i'm getting older it's always convenient when i was when i was (laughs) when i was young i thought young people were where it was at because they were pushing the thing forward then i'll get older and older then i'll buy into wisdom as the (laughs) the peak (laughs) But, um, well, you know, it's the information society. It's not the wisdom society. It's the information age, not the wisdom age. What would that which look I like? I don't know. It seems like maybe we, uh, whether we're, we'll ever circle back around to wisdom being, you know, more valuable than knowledge. Yeah, it's funny to think if we've gotten any wiser over the course of centuries. You mean, you know, like civilization? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, this you know Gurdjieff. Yeah, I, I read a lot of Uspensky actually. No, I don't yeah. think I read much of Gurdjieff, but uh, yeah, yeah. again, when I was your age, I think, uh, or maybe even a little younger, I forget when I is working through Uspensky's. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I forget the name of that book. Uh, he has a couple that are basically just translating the message, but yeah, there's one idea that I always found very funny that there's a finite level of true wisdom in information in a sense in the world and mm. that if it were to be a kind of diluted and disseminated to all then everyone would be kind would just be dumb with a little bit of information and wisdom like the internet and that and gurdjieff i think is arguing for his kind of cultish small cabal of information mm. you know like these small units and it feels kind of true to me that this explosion of information has just made everyone mostly just stupider. And that true wisdom in these little pockets of, it might even just be slowly going away. But I always like this idea of finite, like information is, uh-huh. you cannot make more. It just can be distributed, you know, in different ways. It's cynical, but there's something beautiful about it. Well, we've probably never been more informed or more broadly, uh, at more broad uh, uh, grasp of uh, many things. But, and maybe it has to do with what you're saying is the finite, the finite uh, bundle of what we would call wisdom. Yeah. As we say, uh, information is, is, uh, is ever expanding. But yeah. knowledge isn't. <laughs> I mean, you know, like wisdom certainly isn't and knowledge isn't even. I mean, you know, you can't say that you know something because you've read a lot of stuff about it. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you can't say you've been to Japan because you went there for a week. Yeah. Or Or even you can't even say, you know, Philadelphia, you know, it's a very strange. Were you born in Pennsylvania? I don't remember. Yeah, I was born in uh, Indiana. Oh, wow. Uh, but just for a year. <laughs> One year. Uh, you know, as a baby, when we moved to Ohio. Ohio. And then in Ohio, we moved to Iowa. Wow. A very kind of, you know, a 
perimeters there of the pure Midwest and then Michigan. Uh, hmm. And then I went to graduate school in Indiana, but it was not Midwest. It was not Midwest culture. It was the University of uh, in, in, in Indiana. And it was, a very, you know, very uh, uh, cosmopolitan, not cosmopolitan, but it was a university town. Right. And they also have a town like that, I think, in Iowa, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is also based. Uh, it was at Ames, Iowa, where the university is. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, but I mean, Iowa is, you know, they have the they have the uh, opening. Uh, uh, what what you call it? the uh, the first primaries there for mm-hmm. and, and you know and it, it seems like that's supposed to set some kind of uh, uh, you know thing in motion in Iowa. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think they're trying to work on that, but uh, you know it's just been a tradition that probably happened accidentally, mm-hmm. and just uh, you know hang in there because uh, it was easy easy to keep repeating that but yeah. um, you know the country is divided and oh yeah we go the division we... now seems to be not so much geographical although it looks that way a lot when you look at you know what part of the map is red and what part of it's yeah, what part of it's blue? But let's let's avoid the. Yeah, we can go into that <laughs> trap. You know, something I asked Emily is I find the, this interesting the way that younger artists identify themselves. But I asked her if she identifies as as a disabled artist because I was looking at an article and this headline was making it very evident that she was disabled. Right, and. And we talked about your generation and the way that would be approached. And mm-hmm. I never liked the reduction of the person to their identity unless it was paramount to the work itself. But here, like, I do you identify as such? I assume you don't. No, you're just uh, an artist. Fact, I, I don't like. Uh, uh, I don't like. You know, it, woman artist, male artist. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't like those kind of things. In fact. Uh, I don't like to see resumes. True. <laughs> when, when you look at an artist's, uh, you know, uh, uh, work, yeah, uh, I don't like to see resumes because you can really shape those in, in a way that uh, uh, that people are supposed to pay. You know, are supposed to like use that as a way of whether the work is is they're feeling the work or not. Right. I like to keep the artist out of it, actually. I mean, yeah, you can read nice biographies and so forth. And, of course, you know, of course, everybody knows, uh, you know, Vincent van Gogh's, uh, you know, a story. And that could be a large part of what the attraction is. Uh, but it's, it's certainly you don't have to know any of that to to realize the the the, the virtues in his work. Yes. And Picasso wasn't supposed to be such a nice guy. Yeah, I love how they try to moralize that. I mean, it's just a, again. Yeah, it's, some people it's, won't go to a movie because the actor in it, uh, you know, was, was right. racist or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a weird form. It's of hard not to have that stuff affect you since it's it's it, it's so saturated in the media. Right. Well, that's what I find. Like, there's no. I don't look at the work and go, "Oh, this guy's in a wheelchair." Yeah. You know, there's, there's no. Well, I think you can make work about that. You know, you which, can, which you can. A- Emily's doing uh, in a very smart and subtle. Well, I way. hope it's smart, and I hope it doesn't <laughs> doesn't just say uh, she's talking about her own life. Uh, I don't think she is. You know, we we talked about it, and I think yeah, I think uh, it's a cultural. It's a cultural. Um, I think she sees a a cultural issue. Yeah, uh, involved in how people are, uh, you, you know, relate to each other. Yeah, and and what they use as some basis for um, wanting to connect or wanting to, you know, disconnect. Right. But you know, I've never applied for disabled grants or anything like that, and apparently, you know, I could probably get some. Right, right, right. 
Yeah, it's interesting to hear the different mentalities on that. It's like, um, of course, you don't want to be given a show like this is the disabled people show. And yeah. you're one of the 10 <laughs> disabled people we found. Yeah. This is how I feel about the woman artist thing. It's like, here's a yeah. here's a museum exhibition of 100 women. Uh, I mean, this seems yeah. to be backwards. Well, I'm trying to make up for, for prejudices in the past. I understand that. Uh, but I get the motive, but. Uh, and maybe maybe we have to go through phases like that before we become more op- open, you know. Could be true. And less prejudicial about, you know, our approach. It isn't entirely clear how one erases prejudice, but I'm pretty yeah. certain it isn't through such shallow means. Yeah. Probably a combination. They probably have to be part of it. Yeah. Uh, so there was a joke, you know, about a frog. I like frogs. Yeah. I have probably at least one joke about a frog that the, Emily the, would have probably grown if I had to tell it again. Okay, you, like, so, you like, you got it? Do you know it? Well, well, your joke? Yeah, I know the joke about a frog. Yeah, but you, you were going to tell one. No, I don't know it. I know that. Oh, I thought you said there's a joke about a frog, you said. I know that you know a joke oh. about a frog because oh, Emily told Emily me. Told me. <laughs> But, but I am tell you the joke. No, I'm more and more. I I want. So here's another thing. As we're talking, I have quite about a few this. collages about frogs, actually. But yeah, they mostly good. come from the famous uh, haiku poet Basho. Right, right, right. Well, what's the joke? Uh, I'm not the greatest joke teller. <laughs> you know, you should have Gene Baguskas tell it. There's no, there ain't many left. That's why uh, I'm on a mission to rescue jokes because I ask young people to tell me jokes and they are either afraid or they just don't know jokes anymore. You know? Yeah. 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 So I know that you're a jester of some sort, you know, you like a good, you like fun. You like to, I like something that's funny. Yeah. I don't know about fun. So what's the frog? (laughs) Uh, Let me see. I can dredge it up. Uh, uh, The guy thinks he's a scientist. He wants to prove he's a scientist. He has a frog. He's going to do an experiment on the frog. Okay. So he's got this frog, and he and he he cuts off uh, the back leg of the frog, and uh, and he says, "Jump, frog!" And the jo- the frog jumps. So he writes down in his notebook: If you cut off one leg of a frog, it jumps. And he cuts off another leg, and he says, "Jump, frog!" And the frog, the frog makes an effort. He, you know, he bounces forward. He writes that down in his book. He cut off both legs, two legs of a frog. Yeah, you know, he can still jump. So he cuts off one more leg. He's got three legs are off now. And he tells the frog to jump. And the frog, you know, he's got one leg. He jumps. <laughs> he writes that down. It's okay. Well, there's one more leg to cut off. He cuts it off. He says, jump, frog. And the frog doesn't jump. And he writes down in his little scientific notebook, if you cut off all legs of the frog, he cannot hear. <laughs> well, Emily's probably heard you that. You told that well. Oh, well. That's a, that's a disabled <laughs> joke. That's a good joke. Yeah. Maybe that's why she doesn't want well, to That's probably why she brought it up. <laughs> well, there's a lot to that joke, actually. Thank, thank you for that joke. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm speechless after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you brought up the frog because Emily brought it up. She brought up that you would tell me a joke about a leg of frog, and that's okay. the exact joke. I must have at least another joke somewhere, but it won't be about a frog. I mean, I'm I'm all ears. Yeah. Well, what's your what do you? I mean, there's something tranquil about frogs, despite their reptilian nature. Which is an mm-hmm. interesting paradox, actually. You know, the I don't know how you feel about snakes, but I don't like them. Yeah, no, no, I don't like people who like snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't trust them. Yeah, I only know. I didn't know. The, I didn't know the person personally, but he was a roommate of my younger brother back at Harvard, mm-hmm. and he kept a big snake, you know, in a. a you know, glass, whatever thing, and fed it mice or whatever. Uh, uh, 
No, and I, I don't know if that goes back to the Garden of Eden or not, but, uh, uh, you know. I think it might. But I, I also don't think you need that story to feel that a suspicion towards snakes and a complete, you know, camaraderie with frogs. Frogs are just very... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, I don't know what it is. <laughs> what it is, but you know, I've never thought much about it. They're beautiful. I think they look funny. <laughs> and, <laughs> they really and, 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 you know, when they're drawn, they have a way of looking particularly funny and uh, drawn. So what's <laughs> what do you have planned beyond this show? Uh, you, know, no, got, I don't, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, the whole notion of planning uh, maybe I could have responded to this a little better earlier on when you were asking about studio activity and yes. also something you said about you think you have too many, you know, you, you, one of your, one of the things you feel maybe a problem in your own, uh, uh, mind is that you have too many ideas. Yeah. Uh, and I have to be grateful that, that I don't think I have any, I don't go into my studio with an idea. I just go in my studio and I make sure there's a lot of stuff left lying around. Um, uh, uh, the, these coloring books that I work with are really scrappy and they're stacked in several stacks. They're probably at least a foot high. Uh, and, and then there's a pile of uh, collage scraps that are already out of the book. Uh, uh, and they're random, really. They're torn. They're cut, they fell out, whatever. Uh, and one of the things that's happening, uh, I would say pretty regularly now in the studio as far as uh, routine activity is I go up there and sometimes I just think I'm going to bed, you mm-hmm. know, but I have to pass the studio. The elevator goes up <laughs> uh, and it ends up in the studio and then I have to, you know, go down the hall to the bedroom in the front of the house. And so, uh, you know, so I'm I feel like I'm emptied out, watch too much Netflix or something, mm-hmm. uh, or, or whatever, just basically tired. But I often will pause when get off the elevator. Maybe I'll put the studio light on just so I can see, see my way around, uh, go over to what's sort of hanging out there on the, on the small work uh, table. And, and I spot something. <clears throat> I spot something, I spot something else, and I put them together. And I say, okay, adjust, 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 adjust. That looks potential, and then I'll go to bed. And the next morning, I'll look at it and say, I think that's a keeper. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's yeah. like I didn't go up there even to do anything right. to making art. I mean, often I will, but not at that hour of the night. Yeah, uh, it's interesting when one operates under the spirit of play. You know, we all we all do it to a certain degree when making art, but when one does it to that degree, uh, understanding one's successes and one's failures, which I do think is important to some degree, uh, becomes interesting. You know, like some of the comics I'd made later on, maybe years later on, I started to reassess them and say, well, I think I actually failed here, even yeah. though I was operating under a far more intuitive spirit mm-hmm. but i can come back with an analytical mind that yeah. maybe wouldn't have benefited me then and there so maybe that's why i ask about and i i think you're getting to the point where you're saying you're not much of a planner which is i think exactly what emily said to me about herself mm-hmm. um although i do understand that i'm sure you you have excitement about future projects or a sense of the something beyond the current uh, no i don't No. No, Interesting. you should make that assumption. <laughs> uh, yeah, the assumption is that as long, you know, as long as I, I have another day, I, yeah. I know that I'll have another chance to play. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I might worry, it's like, am I growing? Uh, right. That's, that's kind of what concern. I'm getting. At. Yeah. Uh, is it evolving or is it just, uh, you know, production, uh, which I, I don't think I could live with for too long. Mm, and, it's not your nature to, to think that way. All right. But, you know, when you don't sell your work. Yeah. Uh, or, or you don't have a situation like maybe you, you know, more well-known artists do where they make the work and then, then it goes into a show and then it gets sold or whatever. Mm-hmm. Most of my work is still around. So I can look back 
on a, a, a piece that three to 10 years old and say, I got to take this part out. Right. And it's yeah. much better. Now, now something that has something to do with the fact that I've evolved towards a more minimal kind of, uh, 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 you know, minimal pieces. Yeah. Uh, I could see that, uh, that there were many times when I did more than I had to. Yeah, yeah, maybe the truth is when the, the trunk of the tree is straight, you know, maybe that's the analogy of the first 10, 20 years of practice being done vigorously, yeah. then whatever comes off of that, whichever way it wants to grow in the, in the latter stages, that just, you know, maybe there's, there, maybe there needs to be less of a concern with, am I growing or am I growing in the right direction and, and simply reaping what you've sown, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to be 79. I'll be 80 when the show goes up. Yeah. And, you know, by then, I guess you shouldn't think about whether you're going to grow. But I think if you think you're going to still do work, then you don't just want to repeat yourself, you know. Certainly. Yeah, and, that's what I'm know, saying. It's you, interesting. You push, you push, you're still pushing the envelopes, as they say. We have less than a minute. What does that mean? The Zoomers are coming for us. Okay. Have you heard <laughs> enough? <laughs> Well, this this I is this, this is a good for more important questions. But no, you answered them. Yeah. I'm sure we'll talk again. It was good talking to you. It's been a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Thank you for tuning in. Music by Dory Bavarsky and Mingja Chen. Next week we have Nick Norman.